Hello and welcome to the Filmumentaries podcast. This is Jamie Benning talking to you from Kurtz's camp here in South East London. It's July 2021. I'm in the middle of my F1 season at work. And excitingly, I had the opportunity to direct the Porsche Super Cup race last weekend. Uh, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone, but something that I look forward to doing more of, for sure. And uh, and interestingly, Michael Fassbender, yes, he of movies, was a guest driver. He's a bit of a, a Porsche nut. So I can now say that I've directed a TV show starring Michael Fassbender, which is pretty cool. Cheers to my mate Tony Ellis at F1 for giving me the opportunity to do something a bit new. It's been a while. So cheers, Tony. Really appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing, mate. You're doing an awesome job. Thanks also to all of you that contacted me with nice comments about episodes 28 and 29. That was with art director Roger Christian. That's the man who found the lightsabers and also dressed the sets uh, for the original Star Wars and was the art director, standby art director on Alien. And also with title designer Dan Perry, whose book I've just ordered. Um, I'm quite excited about that. It was my birthday recently and I had a bit of money left over. So I've I've decided to order myself that book. And you can find that at danperry.com. I'm not being paid to say this. I just think it happens to look really awesome. And I think you'll enjoy it too, because you're like me, surely. And I always appreciate your feedback. It lets me know I'm on the right track. And it's good to know you're listening and enjoying the podcast, because it is just me here in my little office. And, you know, I'm trying to put this together in the best way that I can. So it's really nice to know that uh, people are having fun listening to it. Please make sure you subscribe and you comment and leave a review and tell your friends because that's how it's going to get out there a bit more. Thanks as always to those of you supporting me on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Jamie Benning. For as little as a dollar per episode, and I only release two a month, you can make all the difference to me doing these. Um, it is work and I consider it work as well as, well as a hobby. And it does take up a lot of time. Um, in fact, you can actually put a $1 cap on it per month if you want. So for $12 a year, you get over 24 hours of film entry podcast goodness. So have a think about that. You know, if you'd be willing to buy me a pint or a coffee if you met me here in London, at least, it's probably going to cost you $12. But you get a year of podcasts for that. And um, Patreon is a really good system because if you've enjoyed the podcast and you can afford to um, help it continue by donating then you can. If you can't afford it, then that's fine because some nice folks out there who can afford it are doing just that. It's a system based on kindness and soundness and who doesn't need a bit of that at the moment? Okay, so for this episode, number 30, I have a real treat here for you. Now, when I started doing the podcast after losing, what, 80-90% of my work in early 2020, as so many of us did in the freelance world, I didn't really know what I was walking into. Could I get enough guests to even get past five episodes? Who would I be able to interview? But through, you know, a bit of hard work and some good fortune and kindness of others, I should point out, I've been able to talk to, and I hope you'll agree, some pretty good guests so far. But this time, I have a bona fide film legend. If you don't know the name Walter Murch, just break off now, go and Google it. Or you can head back to episode 27 in which I spoke to a gentleman, John Lefkowitz, about his free documentary about Walter Murch. If you do know who Walter is, you'll know what a coup it is to get him on the podcast. He's a veteran of some of the most highly regarded movies of the past 50 years. THX 1138, American Graffiti, Godfather, the trilogy, Apocalypse Now. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Walter is an Oscar-winning sound designer. In fact, that term was coined for him um, back in the, the 70s. It had never existed before, and now there are sound designers everywhere. He's also an Oscar-winning editor. He's an author, a philosopher. He, he's a translator. He's a keen trust in science, and genuinely is somebody I would listen to all day, given the opportunity. Um, I was lucky enough to have about two hours with him over two days, the second part of which we only talked about his directorial debut Return to Oz yes that scary mid-80s um, kids movie was it a kids movie um, that'll be a bonus episode in the coming weeks and for this episode I talked to him about the rest of his career as well as some upcoming projects um, I brought this episode forward because well I was excited to get it out there 
Um, so if you hear me talking about interviewing Gary Rydstrom, I should let you know that that episode will come out next month, August 2021. So here's my conversation with film legend Walter Murch, and I'll be back at the end for a bit more jabbering on. So, Walter, when did you first realize the, the power of editing? Probably when I was 10. <clears throat> and it was through audio only. I'd gotten fascinated with tape recorders, which were n- new on the scene in the early 50s. And uh, a friend of mine uh, had one because his father had it for dictation or something. And uh, I would go over to his house and let's play with a tape recorder. And eventually that passion translated into getting one of those for our family. My pitch was, we won't have to buy records anymore. We could just record off the radio. So it was piracy uh, before the, the, the term of it, I guess. Uh, but I quickly discovered, as young people do with technology, oh, you can cut this and you can tape it in a different order than you uh, recorded it. And then you can slow it down and speed it up and play it backwards and, you know, upside down. So that uh, informed myself. I, I immediately gravitated to that, So which says something about who I am and, you know, which was a surprise to me. But, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing you do in your pre-teens, like building model airplanes or something. I never thought that this would, you know, I'd wind up doing this, uh, you know, 67 years later. So. <laughs> you went to USC. So what, do you, what were the circumstances that lit that fire under that group of you there that made you think you could do what you've ended up doing outside of Hollywood and not conforming to the systems that were in place? Mostly trying to avoid going to Vietnam. uh, We, most of us, had graduated from university and we were ripe for the plucking by the army. And I, you know, I went to the draft and I got my card and I was just waiting to be inducted. Uh, and if you stayed in school at that time, you were deferred until you were out of school. And so I looked around and I was, I'd I'd studied, uh, for a year in the, in Paris at the Sorbonne. I was studying Romance languages and history of art. But 1963 was kind of the high water mark of the, the Nouvel Tsunami wave. And so I got interested in film, not really connecting it yet with what I'd been doing at age 10. Uh, That was to come. And at that time, there were three film schools in the United States, only three, amazingly. Uh, USC, UCLA in Los Angeles, both of them, and then NYU. I was in, I grew up in New York, so I and my new bride, Aggie. we just gotten married in the summer of 65. And we motorcycled across the country to go to film school. She is a nurse trained in England. And um, she got a job at the University Medical Center. So we, that's what we were doing. And uh, it, it was, you know, I was already interested in film. But I think if you lifted the carpet and said, well, why are you really here? The, the, the urgency of that was stay in school. After a while, they started drafting uh, students, but not married students. And then after a while, they started drafting married students, but not students with children. And so we, we didn't have a kid in order to get out of it, but we were always one step ahead. And then finally, they realized how ridiculous it was. And it, it became the lottery system, 
Um, and then I could have been drafted, but um, I just, by the luck of the draw, literally, I, I was not. Having said that, that that's uh, kind of the the nuts and bolts uh, of a, a, a reason. But the other reason is that that generation uh, of kids who were us was the first generation to grow up with film in the home, thanks to television. And so it was, it, it, we were familiar with it in a sense because it was a member of the family. And so the idea of going to film school you know, it, 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 was, it was not as silly or absurd as it might have been 10 years earlier. I mean, there were people who went to film school then, but very, very few. So why, the, why was there a sudden surge? Uh, I think that's the, the reason. And myself and uh, many of the other students were interested more in global cinema than American cinema. There were few like John Melius who were definitely uh, interested in Hollywood, but um, most of us were, you know, more intrigued by what was going on in European cinema or Japanese cinema, Indian cinema. Um, and, you know, I, I think if you look at the kind of films that we started making in the early 70s, they have a more of a European feel. The Godfather is kind of, when, when Bob Evans wanted to uh, hit us with a stick, he would say, this film is too European. You've got to make it for the American audience. <laughs> and we said, go away, Bob. <laughs> I didn't say that, but Francis <laughs> did. And, uh, but there's an aesthetic there that, that was trying to fuse global cinema with Hollywood. We weren't in Hollywood, we were in San Francisco, which is sort of an outpost of Europe in California. Um, so that's the, the, the more noble reason uh, for why we were all there. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that European feel to THX, to American graffiti, even even though the subject is very American and the hot rods and the, the you know, the teenagers, it has that European feel of it because of the way it's directed as, as a sort of observer, almost in a, yeah, no, in a well, documentary it, it was, uh, you know, George was very influenced by Fellini's E. Vitelloni, um, and that's who those kids are. They're the Vitelloni of Modesto, California. Just winding back a minute to THX uh, 1138, what was George's remit for the soundscape of THX? Was was he very much on board with, you know, the ideas that you came up with, or they did he leave it to you? Uh, was that a yeah. particularly collaborative? I mean, uh, you know, we we had worked together on three or four films at USC, including THX, the student film, and uh, you know, we we were just of the same mind about what sound could do, especially at that time, given a science fiction subject matter where you don't have a huge amount of money. Uh, how do you create a world? Well, partly you create it through camera work and uh, very inventive uh, production design, but also through unusual sound backgrounds to create the scent. What we would tell ourselves was, this isn't a film about the future, it's a film from the future. Uh, just in the same way that a Japanese film made for Japanese is a film from Japan, it's not about Japan. And so we, and George had originally intended to shoot THX in Japan for exactly that reason. Um, but the, the budget wouldn't allow that, so we shot it in San Francisco. and. LA a little bit. Yeah, it definitely feels like a film about another culture. Well, it is ultimately, but you do feel right. like an alien. You, you, it's like I've been to Japan and you kind of had that feeling where you look around and everything right. is slightly different, slightly off kilter. And it's interesting how your work on the sound in THX, that you can see the through line to Star Wars. You know, you've got that radio chatter with the kind of tonal dissonance. You've got the, um, the, the prods from the police kind of cattle prods are kind of prototype lightsabers, I think you've said right. before. And uh, the, tie, the, the 
the TIE fighters or the motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah, clearly you had a big influence on on Ben Burtt's work yeah. in, in Star Wars. Yeah, you can definitely see that through line. And I spoke to Gary Rydstrom just a couple of days ago, and it seems the three of you really do have this kind of through line to, you know, he he had kind of had the opportunity that you had on THX and, and uh, Ben had on Star Wars, that he had it on, I guess, Jurassic Park, you would say, um, you know, to come up with something new and and, and something never, never heard before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the dialogue and music and sound effects in THX are very kind of interchangeable, um, which is kind of a, I've not, I, I, the only modern example I can think of that in, in particularly in sci-fi is the, the new Blade Runner 2049, mm-hmm. where the, the music and the dialogue and the sound effects sort of occupy one space, as it were. You, you had that kind of smearing of effects. Do you think your non-union approach gave you that greater flexibility in your early work there? You know. Yeah, definitely. That, that, that's one of the reasons we all moved out of Los Angeles to San Francisco was to get away from the, the, the very fine divisions in union jobs in Los Angeles. So you can't do that. We have to hire this other guy to come in. And in San Francisco, there was a union, but as far as they were concerned, anyone who worked in post-production film was just, they were in that basket. So you could be an editor, a film editor, or a sound editor, or a sound mixer, or a visual effects. It didn't matter. And, you know, we exploited that <laughs> as young people would to the maximum. And it, there was splashback ultimately because that's what happened uh, retroactively to unions in Los Angeles, the, those all of those fine divisions that were in place in the mid-60s, late, early 70s are now gone. Mm. Mm. You, you clearly have a, a very incredible memory for sound i guess do you have a do you have a like a a mental library of sound and and what sounds connect to certain uh, kind of emotional reactions because i think like I, I heard you describe i heard you describe thx something in thx having the sound of lace you kind of were doing this with your hand and i wondered if you kind of file sounds in a visual way as well yeah visual and tactile i mean uh, the Hearing is an extension of touch, um, and that's you know one of one of the things when you're thinking about what sounds could we use for this scene. The danger is thinking about the center of the scene uh, because that just kind of locks you into the barrel of the scene. But what's more important is to think of the the transition from the previous scene to this new scene. How do you want that? Because that's where the audience is most going to be most aware of the sound envelope. Once they get into the scene, then they're interested in the dialogue and, you know, the, the, but at the, as you cross from one scene to another, you have the opportunity to uh, present to the audience a, a new fabric and that's, uh, I think, I, I can't quite remember, but that's where the, the lace or the tweed or silk or whatever yeah. metaphor came, which is uh, mentally run your hand across the transition between scene A and scene B. And you want the sound in scene A to be silky and slightly chilly. And then when you get to scene B, it's tweed and it's rough and it's warm. And then you, with that in mind, okay, what sounds are warm, rough, uh, rough and soft and warm and thick kind of sounds? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I was watching uh, Cold Mountain last night and you referred to, to that um, tweed and silk analogy there, right. in there, yeah. The Godfather, then, I suppose, where are we now? 1970, 71, 72. 71. Yeah. So having witnessed the kind of commercial failure of THX, was there pressure on you to now kind of fit more conventionally into what remained of the, the Hollywood system? Or did Francis still give you that kind of, um, you know, flexibility and space for creativity? 
uh, definitely the latter. Mm. Uh, I mean, that was his fight, uh, which he s succeeded in, in terms of the photography and the period of the film and the casting of the film and the, mm, the, what we talked about earlier, the Europeanization of mm. the film and uh, the, the music, Nino Rota. Um, so uh, I was insulated from that. I, you know, I, I, there was no pressure on me. Uh, there was pressure on Francis, but he uh, had his way. You know, uh, he he has a certain kind of Jedi mind trick ability to <laughs> convince people that this is what you're doing. You know, it's that uh, what, what do they call Steve Jobs? Uh, the reality bending ability. Yeah, yeah, he really does, doesn't he? Yeah. Um, I I went to that lecture you did in Prim Primrose Hill the other night where where we briefly chatted, and I I always love that story you tell about the uh, using sound as a metaphor, a tool for metaphor, and right. you know, great exa the example you gave that night, of course, was the the Godfather Michael Corleone scene where he kills the Salazzo brothers and. What was amazing about that is that then you showed that other YouTube video that kind of revealed an element that you didn't know was there. Could you just tell us about that? Yeah, it, uh, I mean, I grew up in New York about two miles from that restaurant. So I, kn I knew the neighborhood and uh, it, it's a long scene, six minute scene, ultimately, I think, something like that. And perhaps half of it is in Italian with no subtitles. Think of that, <laughs> especially in 1972. Um, and the intention was to be realistic uh, and to throw the audience a curve, which is you don't understand Italian, but you can understand what's going on by paying attention to body language and acting and facial expression and camera work and sound. Uh, we're going to help you, but we're not going to serve it to you pre-digested. You're going to have to do a little work here. And that adds to the tension of the scene. And the other reason uh, for not having any music in that scene, which another director might have immediately leapt to that decision, is that there was an upcoming big music cue uh, as Michael Corleone runs out of the restaurant, very operatic. Um, and that was going to take the film into an intermission. Uh, as originally uh, conceived, the film was, you know, three hours long almost. And any film at that time that was over two hours and whatever, 20 minutes, had to have an intermission. And The Godfather was the first film to break that rule. And that was Bob Evans's decision. Uh, he, he said, I remember, you know, we, we don't want to let the audience off the hook. You know, we've got them. And if we, there's an intermission, we're going to let them go. Um, and so he, he nixed the idea of an intermission. So anyway, but that was the reason not to have any music was to give more impact to music when it did come in. But can we do something music-ish here? And that was where the idea of that part of the Bronx I knew uh, was full of elevated subways. Not, they're not subways anymore, they're elevated trains but they make a peculiar kind of sound when they're on this huge instrument, which is the, the steel girders of this elevated track. So I thought, well, we could record that and bring it in and take it away and bring it in and take it away. And then gradually like waves, get it, make it more and more intense until finally it's at maximum intensity just before Michael decides to shoot. And that was, the pitch, uh, Francis uh, said, great. What he didn't tell me was that that restaurant was in fact right next to an elevated train. Um, and that was what I discovered just, I don't know, you know, 15 months ago or so uh, about a, via a YouTube video 
that went to that location and did a pan from the, the uh, whatever it is now, it's a fabric store, I think, which went out of business. Now, now it's nothing, mm. but you pan from that to the trains. And I wrote to Chris Newman, who is the sound recordist on Godfather, and I said, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote me a long, very nice long letter saying, yeah, we, we, I heard that this location would be problematical and it turned out to be right next to an elevated train and I was doing everything I could to minimize it. Uh, but we would uh, wait for the train to pass and Francis would look at me and I would listen, okay, go. And Francis would say, action, with no slate. Uh, the scene would happen, you, everyone praying that the train wouldn't come back. Um, and, but on some takes it did. So uh, he, he was, uh, when he saw the film, he, he never came to the mix. There was, you know, there was, we were in LA, he was in New York, and he went to the, watch the film and he thought, wait a minute, there's a, <laughs> a summer. I got rid of all those. And, uh, but you know, it's a, the typical kind of push, push pull that goes on between um, post production sound and production sound. What's fascinating in retrospect is that the presence of those trains was baked into the performances of all the actors in some weird way because they're waiting for the train to come back and it's adding something to their in the intensity of the performances. Um, and then we did this backflip. Um, what's another interpretation of the scene now is that um, Clemenza had told Michael, when you come out of the bathroom, come out blasting. And uh, he doesn't. You know, he comes out of the bathroom and there's that kind of weird close up of him where he looks sort of uh, slightly goofy. Mm. Uh, and then he goes and sits down and, but the sound of the train is dying down at that point. And then he sits there waiting for the sound to get big again so that when the sound is as loud as it can be, that's when he pulls the trigger to mask the sound of the mm. gun so that people out on the street won't hear the pistol. So that's, uh, that's another interpretation of it. Um, there's a wonderful story uh, in the New York Times back when Mario Puzo died, uh, where they interviewed a hitman for the mafia. And that sound convinced him that Mario Puzo was in the mafia because uh, the hitman said, when I killed my first hit, that was the sound I heard in my head, that rushing sound of blood uh, as I pulled the trigger for the first time. And only somebody who did that would know psychologically that fact. So. <laughs> That's fascinating. I mean, there really is, I can tell from the, the email exchange we've had and the things you, you know, you put in the bottom of each of your emails, you're somebody who really enjoys these connections, whether right. we understand them or not. And I think that is, that is a really fascinating one, isn't it? And what Al Pacino does with his face in that scene as well is yeah. oh, his, it's his eyes oh, you know, and the chin eyes. like it looks like he's either got dry mouth or there's too much saliva in his mouth yeah. or, uh, what's yeah. what's fascinating is compare that performance to that now famous shot of Derek Chauvin the man who was accused of murdering uh, the policeman accused of murdering Floyd yeah when he hears that he's guilty his eyes are doing exactly the same thing that Michael Corleone's eyes are doing. I finished Godfather and it was the success of Godfather that gave Francis the clout to uh, be producer on American Graffiti. Everyone had turned the film down mm. and it was mm. only the success of the Godfather. So uh, Graffiti was shot the summer after Godfather had come out. I was working on Conversation I was editing conversation right. at the same time as I was mixing American Graffiti. Right. Yeah, it's interesting how those two films 
connect in a way because I, you know I've listened to a lot of your stuff Walter about how you would do the worldizing of sounds for American Graffiti where you might have three recordings that you were kind of manipulating right. independently and together to to come up with the the results that you needed so can you just describe what worldizing is and then I guess how that informed the 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 kind of story in the conversation in a way yes uh, it it Worldizing is a term that I came up with at the time to uh, to allow me to create real world reverberation around a sound that doesn't have it. In other words, you take a human voice, for instance, and record it normally, but you want it to seem like it's in a uh, I don't know a football stadium. So what do you do? As back then, there was not much you could do. Now we have an infinite array of possibilities. But then there was just an echo chamber, and some of them were kind of funky because uh, they were expensive. And so what I decided to do was to take the sound of the voice, the vo recording of the voice, to the football stadium, and another recorder play that recording in that space to give it a nice football stadium feel, very distant echo, uh, and then capture that on another recorder. And then put those two tracks together so that in the mix you could decide, well, add a little bit more ec slap echo or take some of it out. When we moved to the close-up, take out the, you know, it gave us flexibility. And that's what we did with uh, all of the music in American Graffiti uh, to allow us to have the dialogue, uh, in this case, be upfront and focused. And the music at the beginning of the scene, let's say the music is very in your face. Uh, and then as the scene begins, we take the music and we push it way into the background whatever the background is, uh, through the use of these three separate recordings. And uh, now the, you're, the ear hears the dialogue in crisp focus in the foreground, and the music can actually be played fairly loud, but because it has no sharp edges to it anymore, the ear doesn't have to struggle. It's If you're familiar with the uh, focus in photography, uh, that's the same thing. When you're taking a portrait of somebody, you use a long lens, uh, 85 millimeter or greater, get their face in focus, and that throws the background out of focus so that the eye knows exactly what it's supposed to look at. This is the audio equivalent exactly of, of that, of deep focus, uh, being able to manipulate the background, the focus of the background to to the moment on a moment by moment basis. Yeah, I, I watched American Graffiti again recently and it's amazing how what you did acoustically in that acoustic space with the sound, how it pulls you into sort of experiencing that those nights out on the street with the, with the, with the cast. Right, uh, especially uh, when you remember that the original mix for that was in mono, mm. uh, not, not in stereo. And it still has that effect in mono. Uh, you know, of that, it spatializes, even though the all of the sound is just coming out of one speaker. It, there was a, uh, I don't know, it's not funny, but it's a, uh, Verna Fields, the editor of Jaws, this is before she edited Jaws, uh, worked with George and Marcia to get the first assembly of the film, a th three hour cut of American Graffiti. And, uh, but then she had to go back to LA to work on something. And she took me aside and said, Walter, I'm really worried about the film because of all this music. You know, people are going to go create, the audiences are gonna say, turn off the fucking music <laughs> after a while. Tell George to get rid of half of the music. And I said, well, Verna, thank you. She, she was one of my teachers at film school. Uh, and I said, Verna, 
Thank you, but we have a plan. It, world, it I didn't say worldizing because I hadn't invented the term at that time. But I said, we have a plan to allow the dialogue to be in focus uh, and the music not to bother people. Uh, so uh, she went away shaking her head, but uh, <laughs> it, it worked. Did you get a reaction from her after the film was released? Did no, she? No. no. <laughs> I guess because at that point, nobody had really had that approach of having that many tracks, in uh, commercial tracks in a film. It, uh, yeah, there were, whatever it was, uh, 28 songs. Mm, mm. Uh, Universal was outraged at the cost of those 28 songs, which was $80,000. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can imagine what that would be yeah. 10 years later even, mm. uh, let alone what it would be now. Uh, and they said, just... We, we can get some musicians in, we'll do sound-alikes, you know, which was a conventional low-budget approach. You, you get people to imitate the drifters. Um, and George said, absolutely not. You know, and <laughs> he was right. <laughs> and then that, that work you did on American Graffiti kind of informs the, the, the Harry Call uh, character in the conversation. You know, we see him manipulating those three dials there. Um, was that your first job actually as editor of the picture? Uh, first job editing a feature film. Yeah. Mm. I'd edited commercials and documentaries previously, but not a, a feature. Certainly not a feature by the man who had just directed The Godfather. <laughs> so there was, uh, you know, if, if conversation didn't work, uh, then who would they blame? It would be this inexperienced film editor. And I, I, I can just imagine it. Well, I suppose we, we, we describe it as meta these days. You've got a sound editor and editor editing a picture about a man who works in sound and is editing sound. Were there any moments you had there where you just kind of forgot who was Harry and who was Walter? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Especially at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> yeah. I would, I would, I was working on a chem flatbed, and uh, on the screen would be Harry manipulating the tapes, and he would press stop. And at three o'clock in the morning, I would say, "Well, why is the film still running?" <laughs> you know, I, he pressed stop. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, because I was looking at hands on the screen of somebody pressing stop and right in front of me was, were the controllers that I would press to stop the film. And I, I, I no longer saw the difference between those two things. <laughs> yeah, but that was also the, that was the reason Francis hired me because he said, Harry is a sound recordist, you're a sound recordist, so you know the character and that's, that's your in, that's how you get into the film. Well, we've reached about the halfway point of my conversation with Walter Murch. We'll be back after these short messages. Here's what some people are saying about the Projection Booth podcast. This podcast takes no shortcut in producing outstanding content. How they haven't become more widely recognized is beyond me. I love this show. Smart commentary, in-depth interviews, and great production. It's obvious how serious these guys take their podcast and bring that next level of professionalism that anyone would be hard-pressed to match. There are few things better in life than listening to people who are both passionate and knowledgeable about their subject matter. The Projection Booth, with their wide and wild range of film discussions, is one of those things. Simple as that. The Projection Booth is the highest quality film podcast around. I love the focus on cult films, witty, informative banter, and amazing interviews. The Projection Booth is the best podcast out there, if you're a serious film lover. The Projection Booth Podcast, with new episodes available every week at projectionboothpodcast.com. 
you're tired of pop culture podcasts where the hosts exist in a constant, blissful state of agreement? Well, fear not. Let me introduce you to the Chinstroker vs. Punter podcast. Mike is an ex-film student with a penchant for David Lynch, and Paul is your man on the street who likes what he knows and knows what he likes. Join us fortnightly as we discuss what we've been watching from our own very different perspectives. You can find us at csvsp.libson.com. Chinstroker vs. Punter is a proud member of the Pod Syndicate family of podcasts. If you want to get involved in the filmmaking industry but don't know where to start, check out raindance.org. Raindance is not only a film festival but also somewhere that you can sign up for training and courses in subjects like acting, directing, producing. There are short courses and full-time degrees and if you quote Jamie 10, that's J A M I E 10, you can get 10% off. So check out raindance.org to see what catches your eye and maybe you'll get that job you've always dreamed of. And then maybe you can come on the podcast. And it's often said, isn't it, that the, the, the film is found in the editing process. But I think the conversation is a, is a prime example of that, as you've described many times. I was fascinated to find out that story that you told about the sequence where uh, the girl that Harry sleeps with was going to steal the plans for the microphone. And then you kind of switched to another idea and, and how you went about filming that. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, there there were... The, the, the screenplay of Conversation had three plots. There was Harry recording this these tapes. There was Harry and his relationship with his professional rivals, which had nothing to do with the recording of those specific tapes. And then there was a whole subplot, which is completely gone out of the film, which was the fact that Harry owned the apartment building in which he lived and there was a whole series of discussions with the other tenants of the building who were complaining about the maintenance of the building and they didn't know he owned the building and so they elected him to go talk to the lawyer about fixing the water heaters, that, that kind of stuff. That, that, there's no trace of that left in, in the film. Uh, and the other problem uh, that the film had is that uh, Francis stopped shooting with, I forget, uh, 67 scenes unshot. He just ran out of time and he had to go do Godfather 2. So he said, well, cut it together the best way you can and then we'll see what the problems are and we'll go and reshoot something if we need to. So in under that pressure, uh, I thought, why don't we make, why don't we fuse Harry's professional rivals with the, the, the subterfuge of the people ordering the recording, which ultimately results in murder. And uh, Harry invites a bunch of his colleagues from a convention to come back to his lab and among those is a girl uh, who demonstrates products at the convention. Her name is Meredith, and she comes on to Harry, and there's an argument. Everyone else leaves. She stays. They sleep together, and Harry wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning. She's gone, and he walks over to his bench, and in the screenplay, he discovered that the plans for his special microphone had been stolen. And, you know, that shows the, the, the infamy of his professional colleagues. But uh, I thought, well, why doesn't she just steal the tapes? And, you know, pitched it to Francis. He thought, okay, good idea. And we had to shoot a shot in which the tapes were revealed to be have been stolen, empty boxes, and uh, but and that was what we shot it, down in Los Angeles. As it turned out, to save money, we piggybacked on another film shooting at the same time at Paramount, and built a little set a, uh, against a wall on their set, and then borrowed one of their B cameras in between takes uh, to shoot. Gene Hackman's brother, uh, shoulder, 
looking at a tape recorder and finding out that the tape has been stolen and also the three other, the, the source tapes are gone as well. Uh, so that means that Meredith was a plant. You know, it was like a spy movie. She slept with the guy and stole the goods. And that allowed us to condense a whole lot of other material. The, the funny story about the shoot was that as, you know, I think we did two or three takes. It was a very simple shot. And at the end of the third take, the director and the star of the, that movie came over to watch what we were doing. And if we had kept the camera rolling, we, we could have panned off of Harry Call onto Jack Nicholson and Roman Polanski because the film was Chinatown. So conversation in Chinatown could have found a merge point there. <laughs> I'd love to see that. <laughs> That's another film that I'm kind of fascinated with, just that where it yeah. sits kind of in the, the history um, of a film. Another film, of course, that is massive in, in your catalogue, and I, I'm only going to ask you one question about it, Walter, is Apocalypse Now, because we can, you know, again, we could talk five days just about that. What I wanted to know was, because you've, you've been in the industry uh, long enough to go from the, the physical film medium through to the, the digital age, but you look at that opening sequence, sequence in Apocalypse Now, how did you manage to achieve so accurately and effectively those dissolves um, in that opening scene given that you were probably on a, a flatbed or a moviola or something like that? Yeah, I was working on a chem, a flatbed. Mm. And the chem is modular. And uh, what I did was get three picture heads and one that left me with one sound head. So I could play three pictures at the same time. And I built what you would call an A, B, and C roll uh, and push start and then I would kind of stand back and look at all three screens with my three eyes imagining <laughs> what the dissolves might be like drawing grease pencil marks on them uh, I would make changes in that and when I got it roughly where I wanted it this is in 1978. Um, I made umatic tapes, three quarter inch tapes mm. of each of those rolls, and then went up to Francis's office and Francis had a video switcher up there, very crude by today's standards, but you could play three tapes back and record on a fourth. And so then I would go up and do the video switching uh, from A to B to C to B to A to B to C, you know, all of that. Um, recorded on a fourth tape, show it to Francis. He would have ideas. Uh, then I would go back down, make changes to the film, repeat the process. And then we, to preview the film, we did a reverse telecine of the Umatic back onto 35 millimeter film. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, you can imagine what that looked like, yeah. but you know, it gave the idea. Uh, and that was when we did the final optical, it was another nerve wracking uh, experience because everything was fluid for whatever it is, you know, six minutes. You couldn't stop. Uh, click, 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 click. Uh, and, uh, but that, that's what it is in the end. That's what you see. Amazing that that um, Francis sort of had the the foresight to have like a, a video switcher in his array of equipment. He he was a he's somebody who's always enjoyed the kind of the latest technology because I know he worked. There's a company I work for because I'm in television. You just kind of describe my job there, switching between A yeah. and B and C. Um, he worked with our company uh, or the, one of the companies I work for using a video switcher that would allow you to set up different scenarios, different camera scenarios. So you go from one scene to the next. So he shot this kind of like live film. Um, I don't know how successful it was, but you know, he's, he seemed to be always seemed to be somebody who's very, very much at the kind of cutting edge. Yeah, of what is possible. Always has been. Yeah. yeah. Um, the transition from physical film to digital, 
did you because Cold Mountain was the first film that used Final Cut Pro on I think wasn't it or it was the first film that Final Cut Pro had been used for a, for a, a feature picture um, no the other other features had done it it was the oh, first big the first big budget film that right did it. okay um, I just wondered if there was ever kind of a thought in your mind that you know in the film world you think well it's a good idea but it's not worth the kind of destructive nature of what you have to do t to edit a film did you find moving into that digital realm that it just kind of gave you more possibilities and gave you more flexibility or did you still try and the decision that you make if you're going to cut a piece of film you're going to make sure you get it exactly right before you make that cut but in the digital realm you can just give it a go you can give it half a go you don't have to be precise because you can always easily undo it has that change the way you approach your editing no I, I still do it the old way uh as as if i'm editing film mm. um but i'm, I'm very open uh, and always have been you know i'm i'm like francis and that i'm an early adopter type person in fact the first time i ever met francis was i was editing a commercial in los angeles and george lucas and francis came by uh, and said, Walter, come up the street. Oh, this is on Seward Street in Hollywood. We're going to look at a computerized editing system. This is 1968. Uh, and it's the CMX system. And so we went two blocks up the street to see this system. And we all decided this is the future. This is how it's going to go, obviously. I think it was black and white. The screen was about that big. And you could at most deal with five minutes at a time on hard drives that looked like washing machines <laughs> using disks that were this big. Um, and, but uh, I actually, at Francis's encouraging, drew up a workflow for how we could edit The Godfather on the CMX system, 1971. So only three years after that, Paramount correctly, of course, <laughs> turned it down. Uh, but we were, we, were, we were pushing at the gate very actively. Mm. And, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, you know, my, my first feature film editing on the Abbott, in this case, was English Patient. And, uh, you know, that was the first film to win an Oscar for editing on a film edited electronically. Um, so I'm, I'm, I jump into the pool without wondering quite how many alligators there are in there. But I have a knife with me just in case. <laughs> yeah, you, it's interesting that you've, you've kind of won awards and acclaim for each of the platforms that kind of existed and exists out there. I, our paths actually very, very briefly crossed when I worked for a company called London Editing Machines and you were yeah. editing Cold Mountain up right. at the old chapel. Right. And I walked in there one day and they said, uh, this customer has a has a standing desk. He's very particular about he he likes to stand. And I remember walking into that room and you had all of the the snaps, all the snapshots of right. the scenes on the right hand side and the preview monitor on the left and then your architect's table well, what, what, why do you stand when you, when you edit? Is it something about the freedom it gives you to step back and, and have distance from it? Uh, yeah, it's a, a mixture of things. It's healthier for you. I mean, there are all kinds of uh, articles online. You know, your chair is your enemy. Uh, and certainly in the last 10 years or so, there's been a proliferation of standing desks because it is healthier for you. Uh, but I also, I began editing on the Moviola, which is a standing, or at least the way I used it, you stood at it and you had the rewind desk and then you just turned and did the Moviola and you could jump around the room. Uh, whereas when you're sitting, you're kind of stuck a bit and I didn't like that. So I would always stand at the Moviola and that just baked in that feeling. And I loved the flatbed editors when they came in, the Steenbecks and the Kens in the early 70s in the United States. But you sat at them, and I developed what I called Steenbeck neck, which is basically the only thing that you move is your wrist. 
you know, you're just sitting there going like this. I mean, it's much worse now with uh, uh, digital editing. Mm -hmm. uh, but with a moviola, you're doing all of these kind of big arm movements and, you know, rewinding and pulling trims out. And so that you're getting a lot of exercise. And it was sometime in the mid 80s, I think, on unbearable likeness of being where I, th I looked at the cam and I said, wait a minute, the cam is just a rewind table, except it's horizontal. The reels are horizontal, not vertical. So put it up at the same bench height. Uh, and uh, I built two plywood boxes, uh, 15 inches tall, and put the cam up on that. And I thought, this is great. And I've been doing it ever since. Huh. It, it's also um, your your there's a term uh, kinesthetics, uh, which is the kinesthesia, your sense of your whole body, and when you're sitting, basically you're a paraplegic. Your legs are not operative. When you're standing, the whole body is an instrument, and you're feeling the rhythms with the whole body. That's the reason that conductors stand to conduct. They could sit down to conduct, but the, you know they have to stand. Um, so there's that element to it. Uh, and the other thing is just one of the things that they've discovered just in the last four or five years is uh, that it was known that we have two circulatory systems. There's the heart, lung, blood system, and there's the lymphatic system. And the lymphatic system is the system that pumps fluid around the body in between the cells to clean out the junk that accumulates. So it's a trash collector, basically. It's not, you, you have to have blood going to your cells on a, you know, if you hold your breath for 20, 30 seconds, you feel like trouble. Mm. Uh, and so you have a dedicated pump to make sure that it happens. The garbage collecting lymphatic system is not seconds critical. It's kind of day critical, hourly critical. Um, and uh, so it, the system doesn't need a dedicated pump. What it does is it depends on the large muscles of your body to flex and to send this fluid all around your body. The largest muscles in your body are your legs. And even when you're standing, your legs are, even when you're standing still rather, your legs are flexing. Um, so the other weird thing is that they've only discovered, as I was saying in the last four years, that the lymphatic system is actually connected to your brain. They thought up until 2016, I think, that there was no connection, the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and it was a medical student, graduate student, at the University of Virginia Medical School who discovered in mice, that, wait a minute, what's that? Uh, he discovered the tube that connects the lymphatic system to the mouse's brain. And he said, men, mice, same thing. Uh, and so he got a couple of willing cadavers and started probing around, there it is. And so now they have to redraw all the anatomy textbooks, which they thought had been a fixed item as of 1920. Now, a hundred years later, there's, there is a connection. So uh, it's good for your brain to, to, have the lymph, to, to have the lymphatic system circulating uh, all over your body. So good you know, advice. Lot, lots of reasons. Yeah, I um I used to fly a lot for my job. I worked with um I still do work with Formula One, so I was flying around the world doing races every other week, and I I actually changed my meal on the plane to come earlier than everyone else's. Like I I just picked a gluten free one so I could get up and walk around the plane while everyone else was sitting because the last thing I wanted to do was be sat down for that long. I also edit standing up. Interestingly, very um, good. <laughs> you clearly have an interest in in the sciences and in music. Obviously, you have your your translation work as well. Um, how does that uh, inform your choices? 
in the edit. Do you think all of this stuff is kind of cross pollinating? Uh, yeah, must must do. Uh, yeah, you know, I I certainly with translation. Uh, you know, when when we edit, uh, there is a chatter going on in our brains. Should I use this shot or that shot? Well, if I use that shot, uh, then I have to replace the other shot. Uh, but it's worth it because that moment. But it, and if I do that, then I can do this. And no, no, I can't do that. You know, it's all of that. Your hands are doing something, obviously editing, but your brain is very active in that mode. And what I found in translating is that it's exactly the same process because I like to say that an editor is translating from the language of text, which is the screenplay, to the language of images and sound in time. Uh, and a picture is worth a thousand words, but a word is worth a thousand pictures, depending. Mm -hmm. And the editor is constantly navigating those efficiencies the way a translator navigates between the different efficiencies in languages. There, there is no word for shallow in French, for instance. And there's no word for the day after tomorrow in English and other languages there is. So, uh, so operationally, one of the things I do at the end of a film, when suddenly you're cut adrift, is I take out the books and I start translating things, which gives me a soft landing. Basically, my mm -hmm. brain is still doing the same kind of thing, but there's a, uh, there's a tapering going on. Uh, so I do that as a kind of recreation, 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 uh, in order to avoid the shock of suddenly not working anymore. Mm. Yeah, it seems to me that, you know, as we sort of advance even further down into the digital realm, you've you've clearly got one foot in the kind of analog world at all times, um, which right. obviously makes you very skilled at what you do. I wanted to talk about um, Q53 as well, which I watched the other night, which I found absolutely fascinating, not only from the subject, but from its construction and some of the story you told behind it um, yeah. at Primrose Hill the other night. Well, what What criteria kind of informed your decision to to get involved in a project like that? Um, I had met Tagi in 2012 in New York. I was editing another documentary, Particle Fever, about the search at CERN in Geneva for the Higgs boson. Luckily, we found it. <laughs> uh, but the film was started before anyone knew that what would happen. Um, and uh, an investor in that film was also an early investor in Tagi Amirani's film, Coup 53, which he was just at that point getting underway. Um, he graduated in physics from Nottingham University, so we talked physics. He helped our film get into the Sheffield Documentary Festival. It had been turned down by Khan and Venice and everybody. Um, and that it won the audience award at Sheffield, Particle Fever, and then it got into Telluride and blah, blah, blah. So, and he was raising money principally from uh, people in Silicon Valley. And we live just north of San Francisco. So he would come and stay with us, go down to Silicon Valley, shake the can. He'd come back, we'd count the pennies. And, but I never thought that I would work on the film. Um, but I, I had been working on Tomorrowland, Brad Bird's science fiction film, until they fired me uh, because they weren't, Disney wasn't happy with the film and the editor is usually one of the first people to walk the plank under those circumstances. So I was, uh, I was in that cut adrift state and Tagi and Aggie, my wife, put their heads together and said, why don't you go to London and work on this little documentary for six months about the history of the coup in Iran? I, I already knew about the coup um, because of working on Sam Mendes's film Jarhead, which is about Middle Eastern oil. And uh, so uh, here I am six years later, you know, it, uh, six months turned into six years. Wow. 
I, I saw in the film we see those coloured shapes on the wall and I think there's even a sequence of you kind of cutting them out and writing on them. Is that kind of like a paper edit or like a... Yeah. Yeah. And you've got a whole... Clearly you have a whole language developed there in terms of colour and shape and everything else. Is that something you've been doing for a number of years? Yeah, yeah. No, since... Uh, I don't know. We, we started doing it on THX. Uh, mm. It's 50 years old. Yeah. Each, each card is a scene and... The, there are a couple of words written on the card that give a thumbnail description of the scene. And then the size of the card tells how long the scene might be. And the colors indicate, is it action? Is it thoughtful? Is it, uh, does everything turn around this scene? In that case, I turn the card and change it into a diamond shape. Uh, what I call elbow scenes, where everything mm -hmm. leads to this and then you go off in another direction. So yeah, it's, that's how we wrote the film. Mm -hmm. um, and you are credited as writer on that yeah. film as well, along with uh, Taggy. Yeah. Um, I heard you say once before about you didn't like the idea of footage kind of piling up, you know, uh, on, a, on another film. I can't remember which one it was, but when you entered working on Coup 53, how many hours of footage were you walking into there? Uh, not that much. Uh, oh, really? I, th I think when I started in 2015, um, he'd, he'd, he'd collected, uh, he'd shot interviews and he'd collected archive. It was probably 40 hours. Hmm. But over the next four years, we eventually maxed out at 532 hours of material, which is a, wow. a personal best for me. Yes. <laughs> uh, that, that's the most I've ever had to deal with. Just want to give people a chance to find out how to see it. So if you want to just let them know where to sure. go. Yeah, it's, uh, you can buy a ticket. Uh, I, think, I think it's now five pounds or something uh, at coup53.com. It's a, it's a controversial film for all kinds of reasons. Uh, we screened the film at Telluride, that was its premiere, and sold out. Uh, Sony Pictures came over after the screening and said, great, let's, let's talk. And then they went cold. And that experience was repeated over and over and over again of people who got, were very interested in the film, but then something happens and they go quiet. Uh, Mostly, they just, they don't even say no, they just disappear. We, we call it the Coup 53 fade. And uh, we were threatened with law, defamation, defamatory lawsuits of defamation by Brian Lapping and Norma Percy, uh, very esteemed uh, British documentarians uh, who made End of Empire, which was a uh, one of a 14-part series that we drew from. It's a, it's a long story. In the end, there was no basis for the lawsuit, and we fought it legally, and it, was, uh, it, it, it wasn't dismissed because it never happened. Um, but it, uh, they, they forced us to take the film offline because ITV then withdrew the threat of the lawsuit, made ITV withdraw permission for 14 minutes of crucial archive, which they eventually gave us. So it, uh, it's, a, it's about uh, the US and Britain complicity in killing democracy in Iran in 1953 uh, and installing basically a dictator in the form of the Shah of Iran who moved from constitutional monarch to absolute monarch. For 25 years, the uh, the uh, secret service that he employed and the other uh, severe restrictions that were used to quiet dissent eventually boiled over in 1979, and and the pendulum swung to the Islamic Republic, uh, which is basically where things are today. So there's an argument to be made that if Britain and the U.S. Uh, had not done what they did in 1953, 
the situation in the Middle East would be vastly different than it is today. So anyway, that's a, uh, Britain uh, has not admitted uh, officially that anything like this ever happened. Um, and so there is a reluctance to confront this issue here officially. And part of the resistance to distributing the film or showing it on television is this, no, we don't talk about that. Because in our film, we have uh, the, the prize of the film is the testimony of uh, an MI6 agent, Norman Darbyshire, who went rogue, in a sense, and gave an interview recorded on tape uh, and transcribed, never used by this, this End of Empire program, in which he admitted that, yes, this was the truth, and he wrote the plan for the coup, and he directed the coup by radio from Cyprus uh, through his agents on the ground. And, uh, you know, this is an accusation that needs ultimately to be confronted by the British government. Yeah. yeah. There, we, we distributed the film in uh, using VOD, Video On Demand, linked to willing theaters and other organizations so, and we split the proceeds. So you, you would go to um, a theater near you, with, and there are sites uh, on our website, and say, I want to see this film. You pay the money, and then you get the, the film to download. The theater gets half, and we get half. And that was the model, and the film got fantastic reviews. It was reviewed by everybody from the Telegraph to the Financial Times to the Morning Star to the Daily Mail to the Evening Standard to and the American equivalent of all this, you know, 100% positive reviews. So it, it's a it's a peculiar situation. I mean, I, I've never had a film get as good reviews as this film, and yet nobody is willing to distribute it. So there's a paradox there, which we're still dealing with. It It's being shown in France right now, at a festival and uh, we'll see. Great, well hopefully uh, my listeners will support you and Taggy's investment in this and uh, get out there and, and see the film either in a cinema or on their, their home system. Yeah. Just have one final question Walter because I'm aware that we've hit an hour and something here. Um, I was quite uh, excited to hear you mention that you're in the process of writing a new book at the moment because so many of us will have read your In the Blink of an Eye, um, which ends, what, in 92, 93, was it out? That was, yeah, it, it's, Blink was first published almost 30 years ago. Yeah. Mm. And does the new book continue on from there? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Blink uh, almost exclusively talks about editing and this book uh, called suddenly something clicked uh, uh talks about sound mixing sound recording directing writing um basically it covers a much more ground than that and i'm in the middle of writing it in fact uh the chapter i'm writing at the moment is about standing to edit hmm. uh, all basically the the things that we just talked about are mm. what is in that chapter and without putting any pressure on you, when, when can we expect to see uh, the uh, new book? It, it, I'm guessing this time next year. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much for giving your time, Walter. And, um, you know, from everyone on this side of, of, of filmmaking, thanks for everything you do because... Sure. Um, You've, you know, I, I think what's amazing about you, Walter, is that not only have you had such an impact on the on the sort of film culture, but being able to educate the audience as well, I think, is a really important part of that. So, yeah, thanks for everything you've done. All right. You bet. Sorry, just having a cup of tea there. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Walter Murch. Um, after we conducted this interview, Walter got in touch and asked if I got what I wanted. And I replied saying, well, of course I had so many other questions, Walter, but um, I was aware that we only had a certain limit of time. And he said, well, what, what else would you like to talk about? And I said, well, I didn't talk to you about Return to Oz. So he got back to me saying, well, let's do it next week. So the following Monday, 
We zoomed again for about 45 minutes um, about his film and his experiences making it. And as I said in the intro, I'll put that out as a little bonus episode next month, August 2021. Coming up on the podcast, I have my conversation with director John Patrick Shanley, sound designer Gary Rydstrom. Tomorrow I'm speaking with the very talented Gabriel Hardman, comic and storyboard artist. I've also been in touch with Howard Kazanjian again. His book is due out in August, I think actually September here in the UK. So um, he wanted me to, of course, read the book before I interview him. So I'll, hopefully I'll be doing that soon. I've also got in touch with a couple of big names, um, a, a very well-known Oscar-winning director who is tentatively interested, and I'm trying to convince him at the moment, and a cinematographer um, who's pretty high profile, actually, some worked on some pretty awesome movies. So fingers crossed. He said yes, but we're just trying to figure out a date. And also a special effects guru. Now you're probably thinking Dennis Muren, John Dykstra. I've actually managed to get in touch with Douglas Trumbull. Now he hasn't replied yet, but I'm hoping that he does. Hopefully he'll get back to me soon. More on that later, hopefully. Um, another guest that I've mentioned that's been coming up for a while and we're still trying to fix a new day. I unfortunately had to cancel because something came up is Colin Gowdy. I don't know whether it's Gowdy or Goody. I'm going to have to ask him this. Um, but I did actually meet him. He kindly invited me out for his birthday drinks. He was down visiting in London and got together with a group of friends, some editors, some special effects people, uh, some directors. And I had a lovely evening sat in Green Park out in the open in safety. Um, having a drink and a chat um, for the first time in what feels like an age, meeting new people and uh, yeah, just, just getting myself involved in some really interesting conversations. So thanks uh, to Colin for that and hopefully he'll be on the podcast soon because he's such a lovely guy and he's so talented, he's so good at what he does. I just want to kind of pick his brains and, and see what's going on in there. I'm also planning to run a competition for just my patrons in the coming weeks with some pretty cool prizes actually so if you want a chance of winning if you're already a patron you don't have to do anything you're already in the mix if you do want to get an entry you have to become a patron so you've currently got about a one in 55 chance of winning so keep your eyes on twitter at jamie swb for more info on that later on thanks for listening and i hope you can join me again for the next episode of the filming entries podcast Harry Call. Can you hear me?